composer. Um, although I've heard the joke that you're a young composer until you retire, um, but I'm, I'm, you know, just graduated from PSU. Um, and one of my big projects as a recent alumnus was to work on an issue of Subito, which is their uh, music journal. Um, it's run by uh, their musicology department, you know, to host, um, you know, graduate uh, essays and research projects. And for the 2020 issue, my main contribution was, in addition to editing, present, uh, writing a series of articles on the new Polish school. And I thought that this would be a great opportunity for me to present some of the uh, things that I learned through the process of doing, you know, spending months, you know, reading about Polish music and listening to Polish music. And I thought that would be interesting to present on. Um, uh, one thing also is that I tried my best to get the Polish pronunciations as good as possible, but a combination of, you know, Polish not being my native language, in addition to being somewhat dyslexic, um, makes it very hard for me to try to pronounce these things correctly. So pardon me if I don't get it all right, but I'll try my best. Um, and I also, for this presentation, I did not want to simply just reiterate the points that I made in my articles, but I wanted to kind of expand on some points and maybe talk about some of the more in-depth compositional aspects of the New Polish School that I did not really get to go super in-depth on in my articles. So first of all, the big question is, what is the New Polish School? Well, I would say that the New Polish School is it, it's a very hard thing to pin down because, you know, when you think of compositional schools, you know, maybe um, the second Viennese school or Lecy come to mind. And those can be pinned down very clearly. Like, you know, who the second Viennese school is, uh, Schoenberg, Berg, Weber. And they all had very close relationships. They were all writing music in the same place at the same time. Um, Lacy were all composers who were composing in Paris in the early 20th century. The new Polish school is a little bit more ambiguous. Nobody really has a set definition of who exactly is part of the new Polish school. It's generally, it's agreed upon somewhere during the Cold War and that they were Polish composers. So Polish music over the span of 45 years is going to be a lot in there. And that's generally what we see, and that there's a lot of variance within the new Polish school. Um, the three composers who are probably the most well-known representatives of Polish music at the time are Ludoslavski, Penderecki, and Goretzki. And those three I'll talk about a little bit more in, in length, but I'll also mention a couple other composers who I found to be particularly interesting. And the other thing that's kind of ambiguous about the new Polish school is that, well, the first reference to it is in the year 1949, um, which is, was really prior to many of the composers who are sort of mentioned when we talk about the new Polish school. And so th there was already this kind of idea of a new Polish school before there was really anything set in stone, but if there was any one progenitor of it, it would be um, Karol Szymanowski, who was a sort of early 20th century Polish composer um, who was mostly, you know, in the process of, you know, writing music. He wrote in a kind of late romantic sort of Scriabin, Bergian kind of style. And he wrote a lot about, a lot of very polemical essays about just him feeling stifled by, you know, the sort of overarching presence of German music. And he personally had more affinity for French composers and Russian composers. And he <clears throat> sort of wrote about the need for there to be something like a new Polish school, a sort of emergence of a sort of Polish musical identity. Um, he noted that, you know, before then, you know, Chopin being the big Polish composer, but Chopin was a really distinct figure and he wasn't necessarily a sort of, you know, he was not really representative of what exactly was going on in Polish music at the time. So from the inspiration from there, he sort of acted as like a figurehead for a lot of composers who would come up in the next generation. 
Um, and that would be after the First World War. And it's also important to note a little bit about the history. You can read a little bit more about it in the article. But Poland as a nation did not really exist for a very long time. Um, it was sort of absorbed within the Russian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Prussian Empire, and had only really emerged for a state as like a state in itself briefly between World War I and the Nazi invasion in 39. And then after World War II, the Polish state reemerged, but it was under the um, sort of not the not direct control, but sort of the sphere of influence of the Soviet Union. And that's something that we see a lot in the early uh, Russian or not a lot of the early Polish composers is a sort of little bit of an influence from those uh, Russian composers and the sort of cultural policy that was going on in the Soviet Union at the time, socialist realism, the, you know, expansion of this sort of demands for artists, which I'm sure most of you are, you know, a bit aware of sort of limitations that they sort of imposed on artists. They would criticize anyone who was doing anything that they considered to be too abstract, too formalist. Yeah. Um, also, just a quick note, if anybody has any questions, feel free to chime in and help explicate and if things are going a bit too fast or too slow just let me know and I can I say something can you hear me yeah uh Chimanovsky spent for a while he spent in the in the Middle East I he, did not I, know that actually I think he was in actually in uh, I, I believe in in Egypt and the it had some influences in his music too I'm not, I'm not sure exactly how, but but that's what I understand. Sorry, I can't I can't be more than say more than that. Well, I, I can't either, but that's you know interesting, and you know I I think that 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 sort of segues into a very important point about the new Polish school is that there was a very wide range of influences that went into you know the the composers who were writing at the time. Um, Szymanowski sort of had a, um, a sort of, he, he wanted there to be a sort of, you know, folk, a folksy kind of influence, you know, a return to Polish folk music, um, Polish uh, liturgical music. Um, and we do see that to a large extent, you know, Ludoslavski's Concerto for Orchestra and uh, Goretzky's New Polish or Old Polish Music would probably be the two big pieces in that style. Um, but they're not at all representative of all music that was being written at the time. And that is pretty much just one sort of section of that. Um, there's a big influence from electronic music, um, especially among the more experimental composers. Warsaw was actually home of one of the first um, electronic music research facilities in the world um, after Milan, Paris, and New York. So there were a lot of, you know, the sort of younger generation of Polish composers who were writing music at, in that sort of research facility and sort of experimenting with it and experimenting with some of the, early, some of the, you know, experiments with how you can sort of create music with both computers and acoustic instruments at the same time. Um, and I think also important to note is that um, I'll get more into the Warsaw Autumn a little bit later, but needless to say, that was the big music festival that they were hosting. Um, and I sort of take that to be at least somewhat representative of the sort of music that they found interesting or that they were taking influence from. Because prior to 56, when the first Warsaw Autumn Festival was held, um, they, they weren't really able to hear much music beyond the sort of Eastern part of Europe. So they were mostly hearing, you know, P Polish composers um, and Russian composers in particular. But at the first Warsaw Autumn Festival, you have a very, very wide range of composers. And especially considering how contemporary that was, you know, you have a couple, you know, big names like Brahms and Tchaikovsky, but Consider, considering that this was 56, hearing pieces by Dutiu, Messian, um, Berg and Schoenberg, Janacek, Bartok, 
Kachaturian, Prokofiev, um, Britain. That's very like modern for the time, especially. And what's also notable about them is that they were playing these pieces alongside premieres of new works by Polish composers or recently composed works by Polish composers, which helped situate these things within the same context. To sort of say that, oh, we're Polish composers, we're writing music, and this is our identity amongst all these other musical traditions that are going on, you know, around Europe at the time. And at the 58 um, Warsaw Autumn Festival, you had pieces by a bunch of the Darmstadt composers like Berio, Ligeti, Plessier, Moderna, Stockhausen, and John Cage. Interestingly enough, um, Ludoslavsky cited John Cage as a big influence, which I found pretty surprising. <laughs> so I think that that gives at least a pretty good overview of at least some of the sort of influences that were going into um, Polish composers at the time. But overall, the real interesting part was that they sort of took these influences in a very, very like distinct direction. And that is sort of what makes them most interesting too, because, you know, those three big names uh, have a lot of like, you know, they have a lot going for them musically. Um, so first I'm going to talk about Goretzky and most people know Goretzky for probably the third symphony, uh, which, you know, had the famous release on none such records in 92. Um, one of the best selling classical records of all time. Um, but, and it's sort of known for that sort of like, you know, religious, um, sort of style, but his early work was actually very radical. Um, there was an early piece of his that was premiered at one of the autumn, the Warsaw Autumn Festivals called Collisions or Skontri that did a lot of very interesting stuff at the time. He specified the particular arrangement of the musicians in the placement in the orchestra so that, you know, spatial elements became a part of the composition, much in the same way that Stockhausen's Gruppen uh, was doing similar things around the same time. Um, there were, you know, there was this big sort of approach towards like these big sweeping gestures that would move not just through, like throughout the whole ensemble, you know, not just spatially, but like these big thick chords and, you know, tight dissonances. And one thing that was also really cool is that um, some of the like harmonic motion did not come from traditional harmonic structures nor from like serialism, but would come from timbral alterations of a 12 note chord. So there would be all 12 pitches would be sort of organized into different um, segments and different octaves. And through basically changing those um, octave placements and changing which instruments were playing them, it would create these like minor timbral variations. Um, and it's very important to note that this was 19, this was the late 50s. This was, you know, not something that was very like common at the time. Like I think Ligeti was probably the only other sort of prominent composer that was, you know, really doing stuff like that at the time. And the other thing that was interesting about that was that the 12 tone aspect. Um, composers in Poland were aware of serialism. You know, of course they heard this music and they were interested in it. You know, the authorities were not necessarily keen on, you know, having like, you know, Darmstadt composers come in all the time, but, you know, they, they were, and they weren't necessarily interested in the more strict <coughs> approach to serialism that, you know, the Darmstadt composers had, you know, they weren't trying to emulate Belez, but they sort of came up with more particular ways of using these serial techniques in service of particular sort of gestures or ideas, which is a very general sort of commonality between a lot of these composers is that they used things like serialism in very particular ways and that the technique was always in service of whatever aesthetic goals or sort of expressive goals that they were going for rather than, you know, an end in itself as it seemed like the Darmstadt composers were really 
aiming towards. So their approach to 12 tone music was closer to like say Britain or, or uh, Copeland. Um, and okay, I just gotta grab myself, you know, talking a lot. Um, is it, does everybody sort of, is everybody doing all right? Yeah. I feel the need to, you know, sort of see how my audience is doing. Remember to breathe. Yes, yes, thanks, thanks, Maddie. Um, so a couple of things that I brought up there that I would like to go a little bit more in depth on is the concept of sonorism, which was a term that was coined by various um, Polish musicologists to describe this sort of aesthetic that was emerging out of Poland around the late 50s, early 60s. Um, and one quote about it by um, Iwona Lindstedt, who is one of the musicologists who really helped a lot of this research, um, said that this style, quote, operated through subtle nuances of slowly evolving sound masses instead of dramatic contrasts and thematic development. And I think that's a good explanation for what it kind of is. Um, I think that when you look at a lot of this sonoristic music, it wasn't necessarily subtle. You know, especially when you look at like Penderecki, he was not subtle at all. And I think that that's one of the things that made his music so interesting. Um, and that's kind of a general um, problem with the term sonorism is that it's so broad to the point that it's almost uh, useless as a term that you can pretty much apply it to nearly anything and all the, all the various Polish composers, not just the three who I mentioned, but some of the lesser known composers like Tadeusz Baird, Kazimierz Serdoki, Zygmunt Krauss, um, they used similar, very different techniques. You know, some of them experimented with multiphonics or, you know, sort of a more kind of Webernian approach to serialism. Um, and those, all could be grouped under this sort of sonorism. Or you could even group um, Szymanowski under sonorism if you were doing it in such a way that you were sort of more focused on timbre. It, again, it's one of those terms that is so broad that is almost unhelpful. Um, but I, I sort of wrote down that some of the general concerns sort of aesthetically would be things like sound color, motion and stasis, heterophony, spatialization, layered textures, and non-functional harmony. So hopefully that at least gives some sort of guidance for um, sort of what is kind of going on with it. So to sort of move on to um, Penderecki, you know, RIP, he died earlier this year. Um, and one of my articles for this issue was an obituary for Penderecki. So he's probably most well known for one of his early pieces that premiered in 61 called Threnody for the Victims of Hiroshima, which surprisingly did not actually serve as a point of inspiration at first. Um, he had just originally written the piece and then he sort of attached that title to it afterwards, which I find kind of surprising because that piece is just so dramatic that, you know, you kind of think of it sort of having that sort of in mind and considering that a lot of his later work would deal very explicitly with, with particular sort of tragic events, um, such as the DSEA, which dealt with the Holocaust or the Polish Requiem, um, as well as you know, a bunch of other of his works. It's sort of a running theme throughout a lot of his work is tragedy and sort of you know coping with tragedy. And of course, you know. He's very well known for that period, advancing a lot of new extended techniques because, you know, if you're creating this timbral sort of abstract approach to composition, you kind of get bored with, you know, major and minor chords or serialism and you try to look for new ways of making sounds and sort of, you know, making new something that sounds entirely new. And frankly, I listened to, um, Threnody earlier today, and it still sounds like wild. It's kind of like Rite of Spring and that you still kind of like have to just stand in awe at this piece that was written, you know, over 50 years ago at this point, almost 60. 
So I would, you know, of course, some of the big um, features that we see in the Threnody are using a little trying. So to back up a little bit, one of the big things that this sort of timbral approach to composition necessitated was changes in notation. Because, you know, the notation that had existed since, you know, the Baroque and Renaissance eras, you know, privileged a certain way of thinking about music. And, you know, some of these composers needed a new way of approaching that. Um, so in the case of Penderecki's music around this time, he particularly liked notating time durations. Um, so rather than having measures, you'd have just, you know, play this in 10 seconds or play this in eight seconds. Um, you would use various symbols to, to denote certain extended techniques, such as a triangle to say, play the highest note possible. Um, symbols for bowing behind the bridge, smacking the body of the instrument, um, notation for tone clusters, you know, things of that sort. And we see that in Penderecki's work from this time. Um, a very big and kind of a, a kind of difficult, big, chunky paragraph about his work um, that comes from Adrian Thomas's book, um, Polish Music and Szymanowski. That was a very big point of inspiration and a very important resource for my research. It states as follows. Their impact lies in local atemporal and cumulative temporal juxtapositions in superimpositions and inter interpenetrations of the painterly abstractions of sound shapes. These processes determine the perception of form, whether abstract or narrative, while the content of the sound shapes provides the local detail, especially the new sonorities and their sources in new instrumental techniques. Needless to say, the notation of these details is an important corollary factor. So you get a sense of this sort of things that you know composers were thinking of at that time. And mentioning uh, notation draws us straight into Ludoslavsky. And Ludoslavsky at first was of the kind of older, more conservative generation who was not nearly as keen on the whole Darmstadt thing that some of the younger composers were. His big work from that time being the Concerto for Orchestra. But he had his own sort of experimental approach, particularly in his approach to rhythm. And he, sorry, breathing, 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 breathing. Um, part of it was his approach to aleatoric rhythms. So to help create some of these textures that had a very um, uh, elusive kind of vague quality to them, he would just simply notate a certain small phrase and just have them repeat it for a certain segment of time. And that would create these sort of very thick interwoven textures. And when you have something like that, one thing that he particularly was interested in at the time was, you know, what instrument groups are doing these notes? What, uh, what uh, um, pitch, what pitches are they playing? And he was very concerned with like pitch class sets and sort of controlling certain aspects of music through that sense, but letting the rhythms be a little bit more free and open and loose. Um, and another very interesting thing about Ludoslavsky's approach was his approach to form and narrative. One sort of common formal feature he used a lot throughout his work, most notably in his cello concerto is a sort of two movement form where the first movement is pretty short, but sort of introduces a lot of ideas that would be explored more in depth in the second movement. And that I think is a very interesting approach and sort of shows again that a lot of Polish composers were thinking about music in a very expressive and dramatic way rather than in a sort of dry intellectual way as they sort of characterize some of the Darmstadt composers as doing. And to get into some of the maybe like political context around a lot of this, um, which I kind of alluded to earlier, some of the ways that various people um, characterize the concept of a new Polish school 
basically it depended on who was uh, basically towards a certain po political end. So in Poland, you know, they wanted to create this sense of a new Polish school because of, for this creation of like a Polish musical identity or to sort of promote their own music to themselves and abroad. But what we see is sometimes from like more like Western or Anglo musicologists was that they wanted to create this sense of a new Polish school because they liked the idea of composers behind the Iron Curtain who were doing, who created their own sort of Western avant-garde, which is sort of true and sort of not. They definitely were taking influence from the Western avant-garde, but at the time, especially after 1956, Polish composers did have a lot of free of like aesthetic freedom. So to say that they were, you know, composers struggling against, you know, communism was not entirely correct. Although they did feel that, what particularly Ludoslavsky did say that after they sort of moved away from and sort of the, um, the, the political side of things, once Poland moved away from the influence of the Soviet Union, composers felt a little bit more free to experiment with things. Although, you know, of course, not all composers were really um, super keen on that. So I kind of want to wrap things up. And before I get there, I want to say two little things. The first of which is I just lost the train of thought I was on. Oh, I wanted to mention some of the other composers who I may had not mentioned before. I mentioned um, Barrett and Saroki, who were two sort of composers of the same generation as Penderecki and Godetsky. And they were responsible for organizing the Warsaw Autumn Festival. And I think that that was sort of a big thing is was sort of this self-promotion that they were active in. And they sort of engage in that kind of sonoristic style of those two composers. Um, uh, Christoph Meyer was another composer as, as well as uh, uh, Shalonek or other composers um, who were of that sort of younger generation. Um, as far as the older generation, um, Panufnik was one of the most well-known ones. I think his third symphony was particularly well-known at the time. But he did leave Poland in the mid 50s. He left um, before the period where there was sort of this relaxation of um, political um, influence on artists. He moved to London and he remained there for the rest of his life. And his music was not really heard in Poland for quite some time. And also note that his daughter, Roxana Panofnik, is a composer living today who is still writing music. In I don't think she's living in Poland, but she's, she's around. Another notable composer is uh, Glazina Basibish, who was a um, very talented, uh, you know, a woman of the older generation about the same age as Ludoslavsky. Um, she was a very talented violinist and she wrote a lot of violin sonatas, string quartets, music of that nature. And it was a little bit more in that sort of folk-ish kind of late romantic kind of line. So just to wrap things up, I have a couple things I wanna say that I sort of found interesting and sort of found interesting parallels with as sort of the big takeaways that I sort of took from a lot of this, which is, you know, looking at the way that like this sort of fertile musical culture emerged in Poland, there, were a couple things that really sort of necessitated that sort of happening. And part of that was, of course, you know, having a certain degree of creative freedom, especially after 1956 and some of the more sort of restrictive cultural policies were relaxed a lot and sort of having this open access to music from, you know, the rest of Europe was certainly a big advantage to them. But I think institutions were a very important part. One very good thing that the sort of Polish communist state did provide for them were, you know, they established, you know, record labels, ensembles, radio stations, journals, publishers, conservatories, and that sort of provided a very fertile ground for composers to 
not just write music, but discuss these sort of aesthetic and political issues with each other. So I think that that's a very important thing to note is just, you know, what sort of institutions there are. And for me, for doing research in this, you know, it was very useful to just have like, you know, one publisher who would have all the composers there and would have books about Polish music available or to have one record label that was sort of the Polish record label. You know, maybe not necessarily having everything super centralized is perfect, but it was certainly a sort of big um, advantage in doing research. And, you know, the, the other very important thing is the relationships between these artists, you know, these weren't just simply a bunch of Polish composers who were writing at the same time in the same place. They knew each other personally. They talked with each other. They, you know, shared, you know, some very strong opinions with each other and sort of battled a lot. One of the big battles, you know, within the composers union was over who was getting funding, you know, who was being sponsored. And you know, some of the older, more conservative composers were lamenting that some of their younger, more radical, you know, contemporaries were, seemed like they were getting most of the funding. And, you know, that's, that's a question, you know, you know, but I think it's something we all have to deal with at some point, you know, who gets the money, but I think that that is a very important um, thing to think about. And that like, you know, a lot of this music just comes from those relationships that we like create with people in our own city. You know, in in Poland, it was mostly around Warsaw and Krakow, but you know, extend across the whole country. And you know, I think because of these sort of very specific conditions of you know, these sort of massive amount of creativity of these composers, as well as you know, this sort of institutional support and you know, the sort of political context that was sort of interested in the sort of emerging sort of image of Polish music, you know, all those things led to a very vibrant musical culture and we got a lot of great music out of it. So I uh, have that to thank. And then I end my notes with, is there a new Portland school? And I, I really don't know. Um, I've asked that to various people and I honestly cannot say Maybe some of the older people here, you know, have some examples. Maybe we are the new, new Portland school, who knows? Um, so any thoughts, any questions, anything? There, excuse me, there is a, excuse me, there is a, there is a place where you can, where Polish music, who is it in, in where Polish music is done in Portland? Uh, out on uh, the Polish Hall, is that yeah. what you're thinking? Right, right. Yeah. The yeah. Where where Cascadia had the collaboration with the the Centennial of, of Poland a couple of years ago. I is guess that I guess that's what it is. I yeah, guess the, I mean. yeah. the Polish Society, the Polish Library yeah, yeah. Association. Yeah, there's quite a Polish community in Portland for sure. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. I I was curious, Charles, if if um if there are particular aesthetics or techniques or philosophies from, you know, from your research and from your love of that music that particularly inspires your, your music personally as a composer, the things that you have kind of really gravitated towards that you maybe incorporate a little bit or value. Yeah, it, it's funny that you asked that because I have spent a lot of the last year working on a um, an orchestral piece and um, one of the sort of main um, thrusts of the piece is this sort of expanding string canon which technically takes a lot of influence from that third that Goretzky's third symphony um, you know in the sense that you have this canon that's sort of gradually growing in the strings in this Divisi string section. Um, they're all within the same diatonic scale sort of moving up. In that piece's case, it was up fifths. And in my case, it was up and down seconds. Um, and using that in order to create this like thick, rich string texture. So 
that was something that I, that was a very specific instance of something that I found interesting, but I think more generally the sort of approach to sound and sort of creating dramatic gestures purely through sound and sort of having the sort of musical dialogue happen purely in a sonic level rather than at a like a harmonic level or with rhythmic level was like particularly important for me. Um, and Penderecki being sort of particularly big there. Um, although I, I mentioned some of that early Gadetsky um, uh, and Thaddeus Baird as well, I found particularly interesting. Some of his work um, so sort of follows in that similar sonoristic line. Um, uh, Shalonek also had some interesting music that I, you know, was listening to a lot, you know, earlier this year. Um, and while I wasn't like, you know, studying it nearly as intensely as I did some other music this year, I think it kind of entered the way that I thought about music in a more subtle way. Again, and sort of just thinking about, you know, I have this texture in mind, how do I achieve this? What sort of parameters do I have to control? What sort of, can I let be more free, you know? With that opening string texture, I spent so much time obsessing over, okay, if I'm gonna make this this canon, you know, like how quickly do I make the rhythms? Because the other thing is that the rhythms accelerate. So at, how quickly do they accelerate? So I tried various different things, you know, going from subdividing every two measures into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, something like that, and trying various different ways of sort of tuning that and refining it until I got something that, okay, this grows at a sort of rate that I find, you know, particularly engaging or like, oh, it, it sort of rises too quickly, that sort of thing. Charles, I would uh, say, yeah. can you hear me okay? What, yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, as to your question, is there a Portland school? When I think of all the concerts that Cascading has given in over a 10 year period, the answer is no. We all do our own thing. We're all different. And I think that's great in that way. Now maybe yeah. some of the others here tonight would disagree with that. And that would be great uh, if they do, but yeah, we have such stylistic diversity that I think that's one of the things that makes Cascadia attractive to a lot of other people that way. I'm not sure about a Polish school because I was at that autumn festival in the 80s. I had a lecture trip to Poland, three cities, Poznan, Krakow, and Warsaw. And I brought with me five examples of American music to, to play for them. And I also attended about 21 concerts over a three week period. Yeah. And it was mostly compo uh, Polish composers represented, but not exclusively that way. And there was a lot of variety in what I heard, but it was definitely very contemporary, very quote, avant-garde-ish at that time. Um, one of the most outstanding pieces for me was Ludoslavsky's concerto, cello concerto. Yeah. Um, a fantastic job. They had at that time a string ensemble, which was so good, they were going all over the world playing a whole variety of things. Um, they trusted them not to um, defect to other countries, but this was an outstanding group and they played concerts there. Uh, but I had a great trip, a wonderful time, but in the music that I heard, um, yeah, there's the similarity to me in the sense that what was going on in that time period in modern music was filtering down to them as well. The influences from particularly the West, I think, were prevalent. Uh, I think still what you mentioned, Penderecki's Threnody, is still pretty much an outstanding, outstanding piece. Um, uh, he's traveled a great deal away from that, we all know, in the romantic stuff. But anyway, yeah, it's kind of hard. You know, we could talk about a first Viennese school, a second Viennese school, because of a lot of similarities with the, the people there and what they were doing conceptually, uh, particularly in the second school with atonality, where that was heading. 
But a Polish school, I don't know. I'm left sort of hanging in there, but I understand what you're saying. Yes, that's it. I'm done. Great. Well, and, and that was kind of one of the sort of conclusions of my article is that it essentially served different purposes at different times for different people. And that even the idea of a new Polish school sort of was floating in the air before any of the composers who we would consider part of that were composing. So, you know, it, it, it is this loose thing and, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to have like a very well-defined sort of quality to it. I mean, you know, I mentioned those composers and, you know, all three of those big composers had very distinct styles within their, over the course of their career, you know, you know, they, they sort of did a lot of things and that's particularly interesting. As for the, the Portland school, I cannot say, you know, I'm 23. I haven't had nearly the same amount of experience with, you know, music in Portland as, you know, the rest of you have. And, you know, I, I, I was thinking about that because when I think of like, you know, perhaps like, you know, the, the four forebearers of Portland's musical culture, it's like, None of them are from here. Like, you know, I guess Lou Harrison was born here, but he spent most of his career in California. Um, you know, David Schiff is from New York. Um, uh, Svoboda is from, uh, you know, is Czech. You know, it's it's hard to say. <laughs> and Paul, you have something to say? Uh, can you unmute? Paul, oh, you're on mute. Sorry. Um, I think we once tossed out that this kind of idea to to like Brett Campbell, music critic, and he, you know, obviously musically, no, we're not going to find a common commonality between all of, all of this pluralism, which seems to be kind of the the way things are all, all over, but it's also here in Portland. But I think if he came up with one thing, it would be sort of a not non extra musical idea, and again, it's not for everybody, but a sort of preponderance of nature. A, 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 a preponderance of compositions that are somewhat inspired by the natural landscape, perhaps, perhaps, just more here than in other places. I don't know if that's true. But... Right, in like the very vague <laughs> sense that we say that like composers from New York have this sort of cosmopolitanism to them, even though that, you know, encompasses like Copeland and uh, Warrenin and Philip Glass, even though they're all very, very different composers. Okay. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's, it's a, it's a difficult about. question. I have a question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe you said it, but I missed it. But um, so did the did these composers, you know, in Poland, um, when they were working together, did they have a name for themselves? Did they call themselves the new Polish school of any or did? They did not. Although there was a group that called themselves Group Forty Nine. I, I'm not sure why 49 specifically, um, but uh, that included uh, Baird and Sadoki and some of the younger composers who were a little bit more interested in serialism. So, and that was again, a sort of more ad hoc thing. Um, I, I, again, I don't know if the Polish composers themselves would have necessarily conceived themselves as being part of a school. Um, although there were institutions like the, the Polish Composers Union, the ZKP, um, where they all sort of knew each other and talked and wrote music and all those things. Yeah, it seems just that, say sorry, it was named oh, from the outside. And I thought that maybe the, maybe from the outside it would be more obvious if there is something happening here in Portland that has a, it would be, it would be somebody from the outside world that maybe would name us in maybe 50 years. Yeah. I don't know what I was thinking too. Mm -hmm. Right. And Can I just add on to that? Oh, Madeline, go ahead. Yeah, I just, I wanted to add on to the question of is there like a, a specific school? Just as an observation, I, um, I moved here when I was 16 um, and was kind of, not kind of, but was looking for more opportunity as a young musician. And I, just from an outsider's perspective, I haven't been 
I mean, I'm still pretty young, but from my experience, it's never been one thing. It's never been one school. It's never been one group of people. Sorry, that was my phone. Um, 10% battery here, but it's just, it's so hard to pin down one specific, I guess, common style. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that's true for a lot of um, locations. I don't know if, I don't know if anybody else spots kind of a common thing among <laughs> in Portland, if there's a vibe among musicians here that anybody else sees. But from my perspective, it's, it still comes back to there's so much here and so many people are so different. There's such a variety here. And I don't know, maybe, maybe there are certain vibes in New York City or in Los Angeles that are common or even in Portland, but just from somebody who's not from here, my observation has been there isn't just one. There's just so much to find. Yeah. And that I think that's more exciting, but that's just me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it is past 8.15. Um, I know Lisa had a question. Maybe we go ahead and move on to Jeff then. Okay. Jeff, All right, can everyone, everyone hear me? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Uh, thank you, Charles. That was, that was great. Is there any any links that uh, to to anything that you went over? Yeah, I'll pop a link to the the Subito uh, articles in the description. Okay, great. Fantastic. Put that in the chat. Yeah. All right. Um, so I've got some like a little slideshow. Is there a way that I can uh, share? I guess I can share my screen. You should be able to. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, well, real quick before I dive into that, um, I, uh, I'm coming from a, a bit of a kind of the opposite. So Charles was talking about taking time over measures and, and really exploring that space. And that's a fun space to be. Uh, I've lived in for the past a little over 10 years in the world of speed and execution. So if it takes a, a, you know, a year plus to make a, f a film and you and your friends go and make a 24 hour film festival, I very much live in a 24 hour film festival world. So um, musically speaking. So uh, I bring tonight with a presentation of, of things that I've learned over the course of my composing years, as well as some things that I learned this year and uh, was simply updated by, but going to a couple of virtual seminars headed to by some music supervisors. <clears throat> and a lot of this stuff might, might seem uh, like stuff we already know uh, when when executing composing our music and, and executing and uploading and sharing, um, but I was surprised that uh, these music supervisors were reporting that this these are common things to address. So they really wanted to share them, and I thought, okay, this is a great opportunity to, to share it with you guys. So, all right, here we go. Desktop one. All right, can everyone see that? Yeah. All right. So composing for music licensing in media. Um, the first thing I like to consider and just remind is that when you're making music for media, you are telling the story or you're helping to tell a story. And it's the basics. With every story, there's a beginning, a middle and an end. And every story is going to have its own peaks and valleys between those three points. And it's our job as composers to track that musically and in the end if we do our job we've got a nice piece of music that supports that that scene or entire entire film or entire project whatever that might be <clears throat> from there i like to take a big step back and when and and think from the other person's point of view so when you're licensing music it's not just thinking about who's licensing my music or could license my music from uh, the 
point of view of a director, producer, a writer, social, social content creator and editor, wh whoever, it's more simpler than that. And it's, it's the fact that they are human, just like us. And licensing music, and it's kind of a dirty word, is a business and when it comes to music. Uh, but just like us, they have a million things to do in the day and only so much time to do it. And so how can we as composers ensure that our music is as prepared as possible and as strong as possible to make it as easy as possible for them to say yes to it if they come across it and like it? So here's some things that I've practiced, I've learned uh, both beforehand and the hard way, and uh, I, I hope they can, they can be helpful. So the big idea is to remove obstacles. And these are things that crop up every single day, like missing song information, low fidelity, no association with your pro information, nothing, no metadata uh, up in, in embedded in your tracks, muddy mixes, the list goes on. And that stuff costs a lot of time. So for example, uh, a music supervisor by the name of Maggie Phillips, she is a music supervisor for a lot of shows on, on FX. And she has a, a story where she came across, the, the way she goes about her day when she's, let's say she's working on the show called Fargo. And she's got this one scene she has to deliver a song for, and it's gotta be done by the end of the week. So her, her routine is she'll, she's got 50, five zero songs in her head she's been thinking about for a few weeks that will go to this scene. And she loads them onto her iPod and, or her smartphone. And she's listening to them to that throughout the day. Um, but then she comes along on, onto a song and she loves it. But then she looks down at her phone and it says, unknown artist, unknown title, and there's no contact information. So then her, her decision becomes, how much time do I invest in my day where I've got a bajillion other things to get to into finding who made this and is it even available or do I just move on? And so that right there could be a missed opportunity for this artist. So those are strong things to consider that, I, I mean, that le legitimate professional professionals encounter every single day. So what we can do is just make it as simple as possible for them by being organized. <clears throat> we can start from the composition stage in, in, in order to achieve that. And I'm speaking a little more specifically to trailer music. So when you watch a movie trailer, it's just got all sorts of ups and downs, peaks and valleys. Uh, what, what licensors are often looking for, again, is they're looking for a story in a very condensed amount of time. Even if, you're, even if your track is three to four minutes, are you going somewhere with it? And oftentimes uh, narrow looking track. So it doesn't have really high, high peaks. The valleys aren't very low. It's very limiting. And so what we wanna do is we really wanna make it nice and dynamic. And you start off somewhere and then you go somewhere unexpected and then you go to a new place. And this provides options to the listener, to the licensor, because eventually what they're going to do is if you're okay with this, and again, if you're interested in music, licensing your music, being okay with the fact that they will most likely chop up your music to help tell their story. So you're giving them essentially with your, your, your track, your song, you're giving them a palette and then you're going to let them paint. And so one thing that I learned that uh, Brian Vickers, who's a, a music supervisor at Disney, what he does is, or he explained that actually is pretty much the norm, is that licensors of music are listening through music so fast that they've really got to be caught right away. And they have about, they give each track about 60 seconds of their time. And not just 60 seconds from play to the 60 second mark, it's They'll play for 10 seconds and then they skip five times and give about 10 seconds of a listen. And so by knowing that, realizing that, it gives you a chance to think, okay, compositionally, how can I, how can I really tell this story and keep someone essentially turning the page in, in a very short, condensed amount of time? So that's really effective, especially with, uh, with, with trailer music. But 
even if you're not interest, interested in licensing your music at all or or uh, want to get into trailer music, it's still, I think, a very effective tool to have in your toolkit. Uh, and it really just is a perspective of if, if you find yourself stuck, like, how can I shake this up? What, where should I go? You know, should I try a different mode? Should I try a different this, that, or the other thing? Just how can I, how can I do something different? And another thing that Brian had said in his, uh, in his seminar was that, uh, again, with trailer music, every four to eight measures, you should have something new. So whether you're adding on layers and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, or, or it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller, whatever it is, have something new that can, can uh, be manipulated in the end. And that, can, that can be like when you're exporting splits or stems that gives an editor or a storyteller options to play with. Uh, Jeff, could yeah. I have a question at this point? Yeah. I'm talking about composers creating in the abstract a piece of music, uh, well, no matter whether it's three minutes, one minute, 10 minutes long, they're not doing it to a piece of existing film or to an existing story they know about. How are they creating the music? To what? To anything that might inspire them. Okay, so it's music yeah. divorced from film, divorced from any kind of association to a story. At that Correct, time. yeah, yeah. So let's say you have an idea for uh, something suspenseful. What does that sound like to you? And, and uh, an exercise is to make up the scene in your head or make up the story in your head. What does that musically sound like? And give yourself the parameters. All right, I'm gonna tell this story in three minutes and we're gonna go from here and then we're gonna go up here. We're gonna jump off a building and almost die. Oh my gosh, we're gonna roll off of a car and, and run and then we're gonna get to the end. And what does that sound like to you? And you can then upload those to music licensing companies, which I'll, I'll get to later. Um, and there are, there are so many people out there, uh, artists and, and licensors of music that are looking for that exact thing. And so you don't necessarily have to have the visual aid to create whatever you'd like to create and share it with the world. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Just to, I'm sorry. It does. Okay. Not to, not to belabor it too much, but I, I am so ignorant about this, but so oftentimes filmmakers for trailers are not going to be, they're just going to use that music that fits that particular trailer aesthetic as opposed to taking music that's the film scoring music of the actual film. I mean, this is, they're, they're, they're often separate musical entities. Yeah, I mean, they... they they, they often are, but I wouldn't say it's an absolute. Okay. So uh, one that comes to mind is like the Dark Knight. So you've got the big Hans Zimmer, blah, blah. And, you know, that's in the score as well. So they're going to brand the heck out of that from, from the get-go. Okay. But absolutely, there, there are uh, pieces of music by all sorts of different composers, even from other scores that, that trailer houses will use. For their for their movie trailers, and you'll never hear that piece of music again associated with the film. Interesting. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, so another thing that uh, is, that is very very important, and it seems like an obvious thing, but but uh, again, Brian and both and Maggie as well mention it that audio quality is a surprising thing that they'll stumble upon that isn't present when it when it really really should be, and so. Within about one to five seconds, I'm sure all of us, including anyone who's looking to license music, if they come across something that doesn't sound right, within about one to five seconds, you can tell. And that stuff gets skipped. It just, there's no time. There's a hundred other tracks to listen through because you're clicking through everything. We're in 2020, everything's online. Everything happens so fast. It's kind of sad. It's really frustrating, but it's the reality of it. And so it gets skipped. So we want to make sure that our audio quality is as strong as it can be and that it is a, a standard and really a, a base minimum to be at is make sure that your files are either WAVs or AIFs, your resolution is 24 bit and your sample rate is 48 kilohertz. This is uh, a part of a, a PDF that um, Marmoset issues to their, the, their artists. Uh, Marmoset's based here in Portland, they're a music house. And they issue this to their artists because they've been running into the, the issue of 
hey, everyone, please, please follow these guidelines. And we want to make sure that we're representing your music and we want to make sure that it sounds as great as it can be. <clears throat> uh, same thing goes for a balanced mix. <clears throat> a lot of times um, you, I even, I run into this all the time. I hear what I hear in my head. It's great. Okay, how do I write this? I'm going to write it. And then boom, I've got all of these, all of these elements that are, that are playing at the same time, but they're all kind of sounding muddy. And muddy, ultimately what it does is it hides the story you're trying to tell. So if you've got a piano, flute, and violin all playing the same note at the same time, and they're not balanced and their frequencies aren't in the right pockets, it's gonna sound, it's gonna resonate and it's gonna make it the, the speakers do things that they shouldn't be doing. And it just doesn't sound great. And then that's another case for just skip it, move on to the next. So we want to ensure that our mixes celebrate the story and that even if you have multiple instruments playing the same note, they're doing so in support of each other, but at the same time standing out. And as I'm sure everyone here is probably aware, mixing and mastering in its, itself is an art form. And there are myriad opinions on the best ways and, and um, yeah, so I'm, I'm still very much a student of that. Um, but some, some basics are knowing your, your instruments, instrument frequency pockets, where they best reside, and then the general EQ tools to address certain things. So if you've got a timpani that, that's rumbling beneath 20 hertz where it shouldn't be, and it's causing your subwoofer to, to vibrate in a way that it's not, it's not sounding right, you can add a high pass filter filter to cut that off. And there's all sorts of tools that are there that are pretty basic to, to help in these areas, but things to be considerate of. And the big thing that was brought to my attention uh, in this uh, seminar. Um, embrace loudness. In the digital age of everyone listening to things on laptops, computers, a phone in, a, in your car's you know, cup holder, um, AirPods, it's, it's kind of an, an, a necessary evil, um, these days. I, I like listening to orchestral music for its dynamism and you set the volume and it's like, okay, if you have to lean in, you have to lean in. But these days, again, if, if, if it can't be heard, it's going to get set, uh, going to get skipped. So the majority of everything is max volume. That's where we're at. So if you put a, you, you turn on Spotify, you've got iTunes playing, they all have their own algorithms and standards to maximize volume, even the quieter parts. And this has brought mixing and mastering, like pretty much thrown a whole new kind of ball of Christmas lights to untangle into uh, mixing and mastering because how do you do it for every single one? You can if you want, but um, it's quite time consuming. So what are some basic things that you can do uh, to ensure that your volume is listenable. Um, because if, if it's really low, it's just, again, it's going to get skipped. So what we can do is mix as close to zero as you can without peaking. This is a hard thing to do. And I still struggle with it sometimes. And it's, yeah, that's a thing. But um, again, EQ tools. And if you really are in a pinch, you can throw on a limiter. And that's also a very, very heated, heated uh, topic. There are very polarized camps on using limiters, especially, especially with orchestral music. But uh, sometimes if you need a last push to get it to really just come through the speakers, then hey, whatever sounds good, I think works. <clears throat> and, and that also ensures that it's gonna be listenable on, on every device, so. Um, yeah, it's, 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 I find it frustrating that we, we invest a lot of our time into building sort of these, our, our songs that are Ferraris and Porsches, and we want them to be driven exactly so. And it's like, nope, it's going to be driven down a gravel construction road in New York city. So just be, be okay with that. Um, when you are done with your, your making your song, recording it, uh, whether you're doing it with live, live musicians. Uh, or on your computer. I stress making it a habit of exporting splits or stems of every section. Uh, this is something that saved me in the past. 
and you can go years without having to need them. And in the moment that you do need them, you'll have them ready because they take a little bit of extra time and it might be a bit of a, a chore at the end when you've done all the fun creating, but it, it is well worth it in the end. So you've got your song and then you want to split out every single instrument and title it appropriately. So to recall a, a bit from the Marmoset PDF, um, naming your files in a correct manner uh, or, or in a, a helpful manner is extremely helpful to editors and the people that, that are going to be using these splits and mixing and mastering them into whatever project timelines they're, they're using. And a great place to put your BPM is in your percussion. But by labeling everything simply and succinctly, it makes other people's lives so much easier. And editors will even get back to you and say, thank you so much for doing that. You made my life so much easier because there will be some, some file names that will be hundreds of characters long because they're trying to get all of the information in. But when an editor is working in a timeline, they only have so much space that they can work with and they need to get to where are the violins again? Oh my gosh, because they've got probably a hundred other tracks that they're trying to balance. So again, making it easy and being ultimately an easy person to work with. So taking, taking the fact that you're, you're an artist and they're an artist out of it, how are you helping each other? And, and that this is an absolute effective way to, to accomplish that. So you export all of your, your stems in, into, uh, into one big folder and just have that ready as part of uh, the, the entire project folder. <clears throat> um, another thing to consider, not necess necessary, but is having cut downs and then exploring different genres of your, of your track. So even if it's a, a piano solo, what would that sound like on, on a guitar? What would it sound like with a little swing to it, like on a, I don't know, jazz guitar? Those kinds of things can, uh, can excite license, people who are licensing music, but also from a musician's point of view, how might it might jog your memory? And, and how might it, it, it make you explore new ways to, to tackle your compositions? Um, so if you've got a two minute song, make a 60, make a 30, 15, and even a five, because Twitter's a thing now, and TikTok and all of these other things. And uh, like a five second is a great, great space. Like, what is the, what's the hook of your thing? What's the hook of your song? A 15, just, just a little snippet. Because we live in a culture now where no one seemingly has any time for anything, how can you, how can you stand out? And these are ways that you can do that. And again, exporting these as waves, having them ready in a file, as well as MP3s, because they are very small file sizes and they're easily shareable. So I recommend doing that. And then again, exploring different, uh, different genres, even if you're not really a fan of them. It's, it's a fun exercise. I've done it. I've kind of crashed and burned a few times, but hey, it's, it's, it's a little learning experience. Excuse me, uh, Ted? Yes? Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to go. Okay. All uh, right. Do I just press? Thanks for coming, Dennis. Do I just press leave? Yeah. Is that all? Bye, I Dennis. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Okay. okay. Nice, to talk. nice to see you, Lisa. Sorry. All good. All right. Um, so next, uh, be, be sure to tag and register your work. And I think this goes without saying, but again, it, it's it's it seems to be a common thing. Um, uh, when these days, in in a lot of um, programs like Logic, Pro Tools, I'm pretty sure all of them now in 2020. You can uh, you can tag metadata and build like build it into bake it into your your song files. Know that it does not work with waves. I'm not sure why. I, I looked up to figure out why. It was kind of a cursory research on my part, but um, it just doesn't work. But MP3s are great, even though they're compressed uh, and not the best audio quality. It's a great way to pitch your work. So you can send that stuff in an email and have all of the information necessary to know who you are, how to reach you, and how to, how to get involved within that file. And it's, it's like essentially a business card. So it's incredibly effective. It takes a, just the tiniest bit of time when you're exporting your track. 
And this is just a screenshot of what it looks like in, in Logic. So you just go through all of it and fill out what needs to be filled out. And a great place for your contact information, literally your phone number, your email address, however, your, your, your website, however you want people to get a hold of you, put it in the comments section. And there's really no formal or official way to, to fill this out, just however you think is most effective. And then be sure to register to your pro and publishing administrator wherever you, you think it needs to be registered to make sure that you're being represented, you're being represented and, uh, and your music is safe and secure. And then I would say, go for it, upload, put everything out there and, um, and put it onto all your social accounts. Lisa, I, I checked out your website. You've got a great spreadsheet on, on how to go about your, your social social media with your music. So check out her website. It's, it's got a great, great guide. Um, and the last thing is like all these guidelines aside, be you like tell your music, your, your story through your music. And um, everyone's going to have an opinion. It should be to this, it should be to that. But at the end of the day, like whatever process you're enjoying, just do that because over time that's going to build your brand is who are you? Who is, Oh, okay. That's what this one person does. They're really good at that. That's great. I'm going to keep that in mind. I'm going to remember that. So, um, yeah, that's my, that's my spiel, but any, any questions? Yeah, Jeff, um, where did you do most of your work in Los Angeles or, or whereabouts? I mean, you can do uh, it, I realize, but where did you do your work? Yeah, majority of it was in Los Angeles, and uh, I, I've since since I moved back to Portland about four years ago, I've I've been working with a couple of music houses here in town, and um, the industry has definitely changed a lot. As far as I, I used to work with a handful of producers that would call on me regularly to to work on, hey, we've got this project, we're shooting this commercial, like let's let's rock. Um, whereas nowadays. The industry changed so much with social media that it all trickled down. It's all about money. It all trickled down from ad agencies. And because of social media, every company needs a new story out every single day or every single week. And there's no way that they can spend the same amount of money they do weekly that they used to on, let's say, eight spots a year that we're going to air on national, national TV. So everything changed, including the budgets, they just shrank. And that changed all of these models. So music licensing companies rose up and they've become very, very big. And they're just these giant online catalogs of, of custom music that can be licensed with pre, like you've already agreed when you sign up, you are already agreeing with your, uh, to, a, to a contract. So they're not, someone coming along for your music. Hey, I really like that track. Uh, I want to license it. There's no need to go into a big, long, week long back and forth of emails with contracts. It's already agreed and, and it's already set out. So they need to get to download it immediately and start using it. And of course they're paying, they're paying a, a membership fee of some kind, but um, everything moves so fast. And um, yeah, I've, my, my producers even had their, their business models have changed. So we don't talk as much <laughs> as we used to. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm linked up with a few music houses and, and I've, uh, I still work with some producers here and there. Um, but uh, yeah, the game is, game's definitely changed in the past few years, so. Okay, a couple of other things. Uh, can you give me an idea, do most, is most of your work done in your own studio or do you work with live performers for given, given things? Um, I, most of my work is, is all just in my studio. Yeah. And I, I look forward to the day putting this out to this group in the world, like to, to working with live musicians. So, yeah. What, what are some, if you don't mind me, my asking, what are some of the instruments that you are using in your studio? Really? It is my computer. So I, I, uh, I, I'm a pianist, so, uh, I do everything with my piano. It controls a virtual orchestra that I've got in my, in my computer. Okay. And um, uh, is everyone familiar with, with virtual instruments? Um, okay. I'm not sure how you mean the term in the context. So like a, like a virtual instrument is like, like a, you, you play a, a key on your keyboard that's connected to your computer and you've got an actual 
violin section in your in your computer. And yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what do you use for your libraries? Um, I've been using uh, East West Quantum Leap for the longest time. I use their um, their uh, Platinum the orchestra. Yeah. And I'm really looking forward to checking out Spitfire Audio. They have the BBC mm. Orchestra. Man, that, that looks super fun. So has any, does anybody else use those? Well, I've seen some demonstrations with that. Uh, with oh, yeah. Some of the ASMAC uh, presentations uh, down in L.A. And uh, it's pretty impressive. Uh, I, that's cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's some amazing things. One other thing that. I wanted to mention, and then I have to leave. Um, this afternoon, when we had our, our meeting session, uh, looking at what Liz sent out with the two links that you had put on, mm -hmm. uh, we couldn't open up the links. You had one on SoundCloud and then one with your mm -hmm. website. And for whatever reason, it wasn't just me. Some others at the meeting tried to open it as well. Okay. So I the first one, it got me to SoundCloud, but it was just a blank screen within yeah. there. And the second one seemed to be a broken link. Right. Interesting. So just something to let you know. Huh. Okay. Uh, to come out. So because we would be interested in, in, you know, hearing some of the stuff you've done. Yeah, that's interesting. It's um, working right now. Um, okay. At any rate, many thanks. I'm going to have to rush off. But yeah, yeah. No, thank you so much. Yeah. Can I ask a, a question? I have a a new uh, composition student, she's a senior in high school. And like uh, any of my high school students that have come to me, they're used to instant success, instant stepping into just what you're talking about. And I'm saying, uh, did you come to me to learn composition or, you know, where, where would, and she's now, um, she's going to be majoring in music. She's graduating this year. Uh, where do I send her? How do I, how do I advise her? She wants to go to uh, a university where she's going to learn the things that you're talking about. Is, is this, you, you got a composition degree first and then went into this or what, what is, what advice do you, would you give high school students? Uh, stick with school. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, it, it, because that, like like with anything that you're learning and you want to do professionally later on, those are the, the very important foundational, you know, the, the foundation blocks. So I was classically trained um, yes. growing up here. And um, it wasn't until college that I, I was in a class I was not particularly enjoying and started daydreaming about this song. I was like, I got to go score that. Oh, my gosh, cool. So, um, and then I went off and, and I kind of piecemealed together my own, um, I guess you could say composition education from there, but I, I would definitely say stick to getting, getting that scholastic formal education just as a, as a skeleton. And yes. you, because you can never, you can never let go of that. You're always going to have that. And everything from there is added, added layers of, of strength. So um, but the and, whole the whole concept of uh, uh, writing for I'm sorry I writing for the writing for media uh, mm -hmm. writing for the music licenses and media um, there's no one course of study for that it's, it's things that that you've learned by by your own experimenting and your own uh, going uh, studying and. and well, I think some universities have have more. You know, oh, yeah, um, yeah. Like USC department. has got a huge. They've got a film scoring department. I mean, your professor, no joke, will be you know for a day or two. John Williams and you know um, John Powell stop by to say something. To, you know, so they're a very well connected community. That's that's an education that offers also its network to if if that's of interest. Um, but these days, music licensing isn't necessarily just orchestral yeah. works. I mean, you can be a musician playing any genre and and get your music licensed um, or available to license. There's never any guarantee that your music will be licensed. But, uh -huh. um, yeah. but yeah, yeah. And to, to further answer your question uh, regarding your student, it's just an unfortunate thing that takes time that social yeah. media essentially lies to you about. <laughs> yeah. That, you know 
being a human and forging relationships and including your career, it just, it, it takes time. And, and um, it's a very easy illusion to fall for on social media. So. Yes. And that's what I found with, with high school, really gifted high school students is that they really feel that they can just step out of high school into some kind of career. And where do you send me? And if I don't know, it's why well, you just don't know anything, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and I say, before, before you do this, you really, you, you have to know how to write music. You have to know composing. You have to know four-part harmony. You have to know these things and not just know about them or skeletal little things, but you have to know them. So she should go, get her composition degree first, right? <laughs> yes, I, I, that's my vote. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. May, may I chime in? Yes, yes. Sorry, yes. Um, uh, I, I totally agree with both Jeff and Liz about uh, in college, it's generally a better idea to nurture their musicianship and how to write music and, you know, uh, Im immerse themselves into music. But just for information, there are lots of colleges and universities that offer degrees in um, music industry and sound recording and music production these days, yep. uh, including PSU, like uh, at in Portland. Yeah, Char Charlie, your degree was in um, music recording in the first when you began uh, the studying there, right? And so um, there are some resources you can uh, you can search search with a term called music industry or music production with colleges. And that uh, will show you some list of schools that might be useful to just give your student the answer. But I would highly encourage her to uh, really just experience through actual musical activities, um, yeah. which I believe in as well. Yes. Does anybody know any, any place in 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 uh, Washington? And you know, she's she has. Uh, I mean, she's a straight A student. She's exceptionally talented in three different instruments and and composition. She came to me with the first lesson with uh, anyway. But uh, uh, but she wants to stay in Washington. Does anybody have any ideas in Washington? I, I was thinking in yes, DC or Washington State. Well, state state yeah. Um, <laughs> I only know I know God. about this. Yeah, there's. Um, it's it's a it's a graduate school program, and um, what is it called now? The Pacific something film school. It's an intensive master's program. It's like one year. And what was the guy's name who runs it? He used to be in Chicago as well, and then he just ran this workshop summers in Seattle, and then he actually moved to Seattle and started a program so there that's a master's i i can email you with the name i don't i've talked to the guy on the phone because i was going to go to the summer program in seattle i ended up never doing it and then um was that then the there guy, was oh, oh sorry is that the guy that had the the um washington commission composer two years ago that wrote that that piano uh um no it wasn't it wasn't him his name oh, is oh. hummy man or something i and then there's another, I don't know the name of it, but it, there was a school um, for video game composition and it sounded not great to me because it sounded like they took anybody and it was expensive. And then, and, and the thing was, is that, yeah, if you're gonna be successful as a film composer, you have to know your craft and they would take students who were not strong they'd take their money and they'd end up having a really low like yeah. people would drop out or not so yeah. yeah i think that's the thing yeah i think it drew mentioned the name of the school seattle film institute and um yes that's it mm -hmm. yes what, it drew, seattle, drew, got it. Seattle, film? seattle film institute institute okay yeah. and also great. Liz, if i can if oh. i may comment for just a moment here Sure. Having some years of experience with all this, the thing is, is that basically you've got to go to a place where you can connect with with a with a group or set of teachers that you can relate to. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and really the best advice I would give a young student is that they should go out and take a little trip and visit a few places. Yes. And yeah. you get a sense of what the what the community is like. And I know many times uh, <laughs> that people that wanted to work in the more commercial aspects of music usually ended up in either Nashville or Los Angeles mm -hmm. to a great extent so that they made the professional connections, the networking that it takes to get into the business. And I remember uh, when I was teaching at Cal State Northridge, I had several students that uh, had those interests and they were in an ideal spot because they could, they had Cal State Northridge to learn the basics and, and get basic musicianship and just a good general education. But at the same time, they had the access to the studios and the professional stuff that was going on right there. And, uh, and mo many of them became very successful because they had that connection right there. And they learned what the business was like. And I think a lot of folks um, kind of have to learn the hard way of the really incredible competition and uh, the, you know what the, what the music business is really all about. Because the classical scene is one thing, commercial music, film music, all uh, country music, uh, all of these genres kind of have their community and the kind of people that work in them. And uh, you got you really need to sample some of that so that you know kind of what you're getting yourself into. And some people thrive, others uh, do it and figure out, hey, this is not what I really wanted to do and uh, can be, you know, get guided. But I think to fixate on saying, what can I do only here in Washington? Really, you've got to look at the whole United States yeah. because yeah. there's stuff going on all over the country, different people, different communities. And you've got to find the one if you're really if you really want to do the business, the music business, whatever it is, uh, you've got to find the community that will support you and that you're comfortable working in. And I don't know, that's very difficult to tell a young high school student that, but um, uh, having two sons uh, that we went on a college search, uh, that proved to be the best thing, that we just traveled around and visited, and they made the connection. It turned out that both of them ended up at Reed College <laughs> right here in Portland, um, uh, ultimately. But uh, as a parent of, of uh, young folks at one point, uh, that was a very important thing, just to take a little journey. And it's a good, in, a parent couldn't make a better investment than just taking a trip with their child mm -hmm. and go visit, be open to what the what your child wants to do. Don't try to tell them what to do, but just mm -hmm. say, hey, if you're interested in this, let's go here and take a look. Go here and take a look. Meet some of the people you're going to be working with. And uh, because music is a very personal thing. Um, I know that from the oboe teachers that I worked with, the composition teachers I worked with, part of it was that I could relate in some way to the personality that was involved there. Yeah. And through that, I learned. And I, I just can't stress that enough. It's not a question of going to USC or whatever, any famous school or Berkeley or whatever it might be. You've got to go to a place where you can make the personal connections and you'll get encouraged and you'll thrive and grow. Yes, and that's what, what that, I did with my daughter, too. I, I, she had, in fact, many years ago. And then we had her all set. She was on scholarship. And then she was burned out and went into pre-med. Now she's a radiologist. <laughs> that happens. That's but right. um, yes, I, I, very good. I'm glad I brought this up. And, yeah. uh, and Liz, and I... I and I know that social media has changed a lot of this. I realize I'm of an yeah. older generation, but I think from a basic standpoint, the thing is to do is to be encouraging and to urge your student to explore. Don't yeah. just set your mind that, oh, I've got to go to a school here in Washington or in Portland. Yeah. You know, look more broadly and encourage that. It, it at least mm -hmm. is an approach. And I don't know, Jeff. Does that make sense? Or yeah, that that, that I totally agree with 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 everything said. And and there, yeah, there's never one right way to do it. Anything, um, but th these are all very strong suggestions. And and one more I would add is that while she's considering, or any student is considering, where you know which direction to go, be making stuff. 
be making mm -hmm. your art, be composing, yeah. composing and putting it out there for, for your community to, to listen to. And, and cause that's how we all learn whether we're doing it scholastically or for, for fun or professionally. So, um, yeah like be be doing it while she's she's looking around for for the next step yeah yes well i hope i was hoping she would be here tonight but she's just so uh busy with a, a million things being you know that's part of the problem exactly <laughs> yes and and if you really love something you get you find the time to do it <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 um jeff so when you were you were st you studied theater right when you went to Gonzaga and were you studying theater at Loyola in Chicago when you were young as well? Uh, I when I was a freshman I, I lied to myself for a year and I was an accounting major and um, <laughs> and then finally I was uh, I had a great teacher um, she made it fun and uh, and then I got to the, my first class in my sophomore year and I didn't have my teacher anymore and I thought nope this is not for me i uh, and and the whole time i'd had this itch of music and mm. and art was just yeah. calling my name so i pulled the plug on that and went full full head into theater so yeah so do you um do you think that your theater experience has helped you in creating music that creates this you know tells a story versus I mean, I think all music can tell the story, but I mean, also abstract art music, not, but, um, but just as far as structure and just timing and knowing when something needs to change, do you think that that? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it does. Yeah, I was, I was very much trained by, if anyone knows the name, Jeff Hall, he's the um, theater director at Jesuit. He, he is all about, um, about, story uh, we as humans that's the one thing we all one of the main things we have in common is we're all telling stories and even our own existence it is a story and so i was very much just like that was just a i soaked that up as a sponge as i as when i was in high school and then through college and um and to this very day and so that affects every aspect of my art whether i'm you know on stage or doing like filmmaking or or writing music so um yeah it, it's provided a lot of structure for sure jeff i was curious about how did you learn to work with the virtual orchestra did you um, teach, teach yourself or did you have yeah. teachers uh, that helped you or i'm just curious yeah i i ultimately uh was introduced uh to it by um a very small company of three guys up in Spokane. It was actually my first day out of college at Gonzaga up the street. It's no longer there, but it's called, it was called Q11 and they were a, a music licensing and mm -hmm. um, uh, custom music company. <clears throat> and they were doing music all around the world from TV broadcasts to, to movies, to all commercials. And uh, so I was, I got my first job there answering the phones and then they'd throw things my here, here, my way here and there. And <clears throat> I remember they threw them, threw me my first one and I was working in Cubase, like the free version at the time. And um, I, I was like, oh, I put, put together my 30 second cue and I was like, oh, this is gonna be great. And then I played it for them and they were like, they were very polite and like, okay, all right, well, this is the one that Joe did. And it's just like, blows me away. And so lots of those kinds of lessons, but very, uh, they introduced me to, um, I was essentially introduced by professionals in their studio with their giant board and. Mm -hmm. how everything works and and the power of virtual instruments and also too what 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 really can never be replaced in a live performer like i i believe no matter how good ai gets like there's just nothing like mm -hmm. it but um uh yeah and then over the years i mean thanks to youtube and and uh other musicians you run into into your in your communities you trade information and you learn and and you learn your tricks mm -hmm. and you get faster and, and quicker at it so yeah and wh what is kind of your stock and trade now in terms of uh software that you use to do your work i've been logic my all all the time that i've been doing things mm -hmm. uh well, until i grew out of cubase which was pretty quick and i've uh i've always itched to to dive into pro tools but i just 
I haven't made the time for it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure it's very similar, just different names for the same thing, but I'm sure it's a very powerful system as well. And, or I know it is. Um, and, um, and then, yeah, I've, I've really relied heavily on East West quantum leap sound library for a long time. But like I said, I'm really looking forward to, to checking out that, that BBC orchestra. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, there's some great uh, YouTube uh, videos on the Spitfire and all of that. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, there's one guy, I, I, I'm not going to remember his name, but he did a wonderful demo. He's just sitting there and, sit, you know, picked up, played a couple things and put to, put together a whole orchestra <laughs> there yeah. in about 10 minutes. And it was just amazing, uh, the, the sounds he was getting. And, uh, you know, just it was like just, you know, making up his own orchestra that he wanted. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty powerful thing. Also, too, um, Omnisphere, if anyone's familiar with that, they have a great, yeah, great database of uh, mm -hmm. catalog of sounds and just beautiful pads and, and abstract ambient tones. So, yeah. So, yeah. Wow. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks, for yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, thank you both. Yeah. Thank Charles you. and Jeff. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah. Good job, oh, yeah. Charles. Great job, Charles. Thank you. I really love how we had such a, a contrast tonight. Yeah. Really yeah. interesting yeah. and and, and um, just different parts of the musical spectrum. Yeah, I just uploaded a file in case anyone's curious, just the kind of the bullet points of what we covered tonight. But yeah. Oh great, thank you. I look look forward to hearing more of your music. And, and, yeah. Yeah. Both virtual yeah. and live, yeah, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. How you? Um, how long have you been a member? Have you just joined? Yeah, it was uh, about midway through this year. Okay. Yeah. Well, welcome. Thanks. Yeah. yeah thank and then, you. and Charles, you said that the link will be to to your your uh, your magazine article will be available where. I, I dropped it in the chat. That's a link to the Subito. Um, my articles are in the 2020 issue. Okay. Cool. Awesome. There's a link on that page. To download it. Great. All right. Cool. Uh, Jeff, can we get uh, get the accurate link so we could listen to some of your stuff? Yeah, I just dropped it in. Uh, a couple of people said that it was working, so. Um, yeah, yeah I, got it. Okay. I got it. Okay. Yeah, it works. Okay. Cool. I enjoyed hearing some of your films. Oh, of course, okay. some short films you had up on your website, though. Oh yeah. Or some yeah. There was yeah, some, yeah yeah I'll, yeah. I'll, uh, that that worked out great. Okay, great. Um, and then here, yeah, here's my music website. If hopefully that works there too. So, but yeah, thanks so much for everyone's time and attention. That's very kind of you. Yes. Appreciate the information. Yeah. Thank you for organized yeah. presentation. Very good to see yeah. everyone. Have a good night, people. Thanks, you too. Be well. Stay Bye. safe. Bye. All right. Happy, Happy holidays. Yeah. Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy holidays. Happy New Year. All right. And close.